Well, good morning, 168. We're going to ask you to rise to your feet if you can. As we're going to learn a new song as a congregation this morning, it's actually called See the Light. And the chorus simply says, No longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me, for I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. Follow me, I'm going to teach you this. No longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me, for I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. presence and continue to be aware of his presence and just continue to pray that we want the Lord and all that he is just to be entwined in all of our lives. We want to talk, we want to sing to the Lord and continue to pray for him just to be in every aspect of our lives. May we continue to be tethered to his heart. And I don't want to miss the beauty of heaven. 
and people who don't know you, people who do know you, do know you. Um, just help us to be present in every moment and see your work throughout our daily lives. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Well, welcome to 168. We are so glad that you're here. Hey, here at 168, we desire to help people pursue Jesus, participate in the flourishing of our communities, 
as well as proclaim Jesus among all the people. And based on our mission statement, we want to strive to live by these five values, engagement, prayer, community, multiplication, and diversity. And if you are interested in supporting the mission and the values here at 168, we have three different ways for you to give here. Uh, one, you can head to our website, 168cc.org, and give online. There's a nice gray give button in the corner. Uh, you can also, if you're here in person, there's a box on the way out. There's a nice tiny gray box. You can drop a check or cash in there. Uh, if you forget, if you forgot today, you can always mail us a check to that address on the screen uh, as well. Hey, one of our values here is actually to engage. Uh, and one way that you can engage here at 168 is via serve teams. I know there's a lot of kids that are back there, so they can't really hear me, but school is coming, which means we're about to all hit back into our fall schedules, our fall calendars. What a great time to get involved and engaged here at 168 on a serve team, whether that's our tech team in the back, community engagement team, our host team, worship team, or if you really like kids, the kid team. I got three beautiful ones back there. If you want to go teach them about Jesus, I am all for that. I'm all for that. Hey, one other, another way you can engage this summer is we're actually having our last Summer Next Steps event on August 21st at 6.05. We'll be going to the Joliet Slammers game in Joliet, get some baseball in. I got my first game in this week. It was amazing. A home run ball fell right behind my head. Yes, actually my head was Liz's head. But hey, we're going to a baseball game. Maybe you'll catch a foul ball or a home run ball. The cost for that event is $8 per person. Let's continue to live out missionally and amongst our communities. Invite your friends, invite your family. Uh, just invite your community out to a fun night of baseball. Um, yeah, tonight we have, or tonight, it's not tonight yet. This afternoon, we have a special, special moment we want to share with you guys. Uh, we actually want to invite the West Hyredall small group up front, as well as we invite Pastor John uh, up front. But here at 168, you guys can come on. Uh, here at 168, we value living in community. Uh, and what, what we mean by that is we joyfully surrender to community, journeying together and not alone. I mean, this can take many shapes and forms. And so today, we actually want to honor the commitment and the service from one of our community members, Sarah West. If you have not met Sarah, you can hear her giggling up here. It is very infectious. She has a very infectious smile as well. But Sarah has been so active here at 168. She co-led a small group this past spring. Uh, she has been outside welcoming you into the building for the last four months. It's been amazing. Uh, Sarah even edits our monthly newsletter. That's why it looks so good. John and I are not that good at English. But Sarah makes sure we look good in our monthly newsletter, and we so appreciate uh, that. But Sarah, John and I just simply want to say thank you for loving your community well, uh, for honoring your commitments and serving the community that Jesus has called you to. Uh, and if you guys don't know Sarah, Sarah and her family are actually moving to Austin, Texas uh, at the end of the week. Uh, where they just outlaw hooking horns, hooking horns down there. But they're moving to Austin, Texas at the end of this week, and we're going to miss them. But as a community, uh, we want to go ahead and we want to pray for them. And we want to send them off into the community, the next community that God has called her and her family into. So if you guys would actually rise to your feet uh, and extend a hand or two hands, if you're able, towards the West family as we want to pray for them uh, and send this out. I'm actually going to pass the microphone to my mother-in-law, uh, who's going to pray for us. I'm praying for Sarah. And, and Father God, I just want to thank you for this wonderful woman that you brought to us to have for as long as you've given her to us. And for her giftedness, that she exudes you wherever she goes. She lets people know that Christ is near simply by smiling, by helping, by just loving them where they are. She's the very first one that you send to ask, how can I help? And she gathers her worker bees to help in the ways that God has blessed and gifted them. And she knows all this because she studies her people. 
and she knows exactly what people are like and what you've gifted them with. Father, she's so generous. She never says no. She inconveniences herself to go above and beyond what anybody could ever ask for. And you give her the ability to do that, Lord. Thank you. We have named her Mama Bear. Don't get in her way. Lord, thank you for the passion that you've given to Sarah, that she fights for the right and defends her own, and her own extends way beyond her family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The only reason we're letting her go, like we have a choice, but is that we know we are going to be able to spend eternity with her in heaven and the West family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you, God, so much for the West family. God, I thank you for Rob and the kids and for Sarah. God, we just pray that theme over their lives, God, that they would be uh, spiritual mama bears and papa bears, uh, God, and friends wherever you send them. Lord, we ask that you would provide them a great local church to continue to do the mission that you have called them to live out in. God, I thank you for their ability to sit in tension and sit in it well. God, I pray that you'd bring about folks who are hurting, who are ailing, who need safe spaces to talk, to encounter what it looks like to follow Jesus, not only in the happy times, but also in the hard times and also in the tense times as well. So God, I thank you for this family. God, I thank you for uh, the folks that you already are preparing for them to meet and for them to minister to and to be ministered to as well. So God, we just commit them to you now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. All right, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be turning to the book of Philemon. Philemon. Uh, now, it's, the, it's actually the smallest book in the entire Bible. It's only 334 words. So if you need to use your table of contents to get there, you can do that. But the book of Philemon, and the title of the message is The Call to Good Neighboring. Now we're in the second week of our series, Unhurried, processing, making space to process the lessons from the pandemic. And just as we want to honor, and we honored Sarah and Amanda and the kids and Rob, just for helping us love Jesus more, there is this guy named Fred Rogers. Have you ever heard of him before? Yeah, Fred Rogers, affectionately known as Mr. Rogers. And he is actually known not only for his children's themed books and shows, but providing a one-minute moment of silence during his commencement speeches. And the whole point of the one minute of silence was to ask that person to sit in silence for one minute and to deeply think about one person that has affected their lives in a positive way to bring about that moment of graduation. And I wonder who that one person might be for you. If we gave you a moment right now of one minute of silence, who is a person that has so deeply affected your walk, your life, that you'd want to send them a heart of gratitude? Now, as you look at the book of Philemon, I'm going to suggest to you that if Philemon, that's one of the characters in this book, and Onesimus were given one minute to think about one person that deeply impacted their life, that they would most likely think of this guy named Paul. And not because Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but specifically because as we kind of unpack through this book together, Paul made an incredible practical impact in their lives and challenge them towards good neighboring. 
And so if you look up here on the screen behind me, we're going to just unpack three challenges that Paul puts forth specifically to Philemon. And here's a quick summary. Number one is how does the gospel transform us, but that transformation is motivated by love and not law. Second, how Christians are called to choose compassion over our own rights. And third, how Christians should push the boundaries of who we define as family. So those are the three challenges that we're going to see Paul unpack for Philemon. So turn to Philemon, starting in verse 1, verse 1 to verse 3. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll pause there for a minute. Now, a running joke is that I am a maps guy, right? And if you don't know what that means, that is not a new app. I'm literally a maps guy. At least that's the joke. And I know it's been a while since I've showed you a historical map, all right? And so as this is the West Farewell service, I have to bring one back. So here's a map for you. But hey, all jokes aside, the reason why I even share maps to begin with is because I need you to understand and I want you to understand that the Bible is actually anchored with real people during a real time in a real place that you can still visit today. I think often we feel like, and as we read these types of books and letters and stories, it feels like so far long ago where it doesn't feel relevant. And that's normal and that's natural. And I'm hoping that as we look at a map like this, it helps you to realize that, hey, this is a real place with real people in real time. So if you take a look up here on the screen, and if you take a look to your far left, you'll see a circle, and it's circled. The city that's circled is Rome. Most likely in Acts 28, when Paul is writing this letter to Philemon, he's in Rome under prison, according to Acts 28, and he's writing this letter to Philemon. Now, if you take a look at your far right of your screen, you see the city of Colossae. And in Colossians chapter 4, verse 9, we see this guy named Onesimus, who's also mentioned in Philemon, being sent by Paul, right? So he's in Rome writing this letter, and he's actually writing two letters. One, the book of Colossians, two, this letter of Philemon. And he sends Onesimus on a journey to carry these two letters to Colossae, where Philemon lives. If you take a look up here in the middle, you see the city of Ephesus is circled, and that's because in Acts chapter 19, this guy named Philemon, all these stories are actually merging. This guy named Philemon converts to Christianity because of Paul. So he's writing this letter to them. Now, if you take a look at the end of verse 2, you're, you'll notice the word home there. And so what we can deduce actually from the context is that Philemon is rich enough, he's a nobleman, because he owns a house, and the central house in which this church is meeting, right? They're gathering there. So he's a rich nobleman, and we'll also see that he actually owns slaves or bond servants. Now, Onesimus, on the other hand, if you take a look at verse 11, and we'll get there soon enough, he is a bond servant or a slave. Now, watch this story and this context unfold. So here you have Philemon, and Philemon is a nobleman who's rich. He owns bond servants or slaves, which one is Onesimus. Onesimus steals things, property from Philemon. He runs away all the way to Rome, and in God's providence... Onesimus runs into Paul, who converts him to Christianity, and sends him back to Philemon in Colossae with this letter, saying, Philemon, I converted you to Christianity. I converted Onesimus to Christianity. Here's my letter to you. The guy who stole from you, who ran from you. So that's the context in which Paul is writing. Now, if you ever thought that... Um, you are socially awkward or you're looking for a book to relate to, you're going to see a lot of this theme of awkwardness come through the book of Philemon because the ask that Paul is making to Philemon feels a little bit awkward. This guy just ran away. He puts a letter in his hand. And we'll see where he's asking for his own freedom. Can you imagine trying to deliver a letter to the master you ran away from that says you should free me? That's awkward. Take a look at verse 4. Paul writes, and Paul is beginning to, and maybe you've buttered up somebody before you drop some news, right? He's about to put on a thick layer of buttering. All right, look at verse 4. Paul writes to Philemon, I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers. 
Verse 5, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. And I got to say, I've read a lot of Paul's letters, and he's not the type of guy who's just going to butter up somebody for buttering up sake. He's about to bring a proposition or something to Philemon. Take a look at verse 6. He writes, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective. And that word partnership, you can circle it, you can underline it. It actually first appears in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it says that the apostles and the believers came together in fellowship and partnership and broke bread, sharing in common and in communion. So are you tracking with me? Paul is writing to Philemon, sending this letter to Onesimus, who was a slave who ran away, and says, hey, I know you love God's people. I know your faith in Jesus Christ. First layer of butter. Now think about the partnership that we have, the communion that we have with God's people. Verse 6. And I pray that your partnership with us in that faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Now take a look at verse 7. It's a butter, butter sandwich. All right? Can you just imagine trying to eat a sandwich, a stick of margarine, some food, and more margarine on the bottom? It's a verbal butter sandwich that Paul is offering. But take a look at verse 7. It says, your love, notice the your, your love has given me great joy. Great joy literally means dispelling grief by the impartation of strength. Paul is building a case. Because you, emphasis is you, because you, brother, have made easy or refreshed the hearts. And here, I want you to notice that Paul could have used actually the Greek word for heart, which is cardia, where we get the word cardiac or cardiovascular. But instead, he uses this word called splachnon, which actually means spleen or intestine or affection of the bowels for the Lord's people. So if you summarize what Paul is saying to Philemon, he's saying this, right? Philemon, you specifically have given me great joy. You have dispelled my grief by imparting your strength and made the affections of my bowels feel easy and refreshed. Can you imagine getting a Hallmark card that says, you refresh my bowels? Hey, if somebody copyrights it, that's all right. I want some royalties. You open it, you refresh my bowels. But notice the transition that he makes in verse 8. You see that key word there, therefore. He's about to enter into making his plea. But before that, I want you to notice, he's going to talk about the motivation from which he wants to ask this plea. Meaning, what he's about to communicate is the truth that teaches us about Christianity's motivation for good work or good neighboring. He doesn't actually just just jump into what he's asking for. He jumps into motivation first. Take a look at verse 8. We're going to read verse 8, verse 9, and then jump to verse 14 to see the motivation. But in verse 8, he writes, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. How many of us who are believers in Jesus, or as we think about Jesus, think that Christianity is about doing something because we ought to do it? Although I could order you to do what you ought to do, verse 9, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Jump to verse 14. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor that you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Not by the force of law is the implication. So let me jump into here the first challenge that Paul is providing to Philemon, the first motivation from which he's calling us to be good neighbors. Here's the first one behind me, is that Christianity's beauty is gospel transformation through love and not berating of law. It's love, not legalism. So even as we get into what Paul is going to call Philemon to, I want you to ask yourself the question, when you think about Jesus and your relationship to him, is it more about doing something because it's the right thing to do, something you ought to do, or because you feel guilty about it, or because there is some other inherent thing going on within you? Or is it verse 9 where Paul says to Philemon, it is because of love I appeal to you? Then the natural question becomes, what love are we even talking about? You know, COVID has brought about a lot of 
quirky applications of pre-COVID life. And I wonder if you knew that there was something called Zoom detention. There was Zoom detention. There's this nine-year-old who was in Pennsylvania, and her mom got this email with a link, a Zoom link, that said, hey, your child is being called to Zoom detention this weekend. And her mom was like, what do you want me to do about this? Do you want me to proctor detention in my own house? Because supposedly the nine-year-old, I mean, she's nine years old, and she's been on Zoom for eight hours a day. It's really hard, and it's really hard for teachers, too. I mean, I have new respect for kids and for teachers after this year, but... She wasn't listening. She was playing video games while in class. While in class, she would just sign off on the teacher. And so she was called to Zoom detention. And as we think about this idea of love, obeying because of love, there is a psychologist named Lawrence Kohlberg who taught at Harvard. He also taught at the University of Chicago. He concluded that there are actually six different stages or steps for moral development why you say yes to morality or doing the right thing. So he developed six different stages or steps. And I'm going to show you actually the slide of the six steps. And this is the question I want you to ask. Are you ready? The question I want you to ask yourself is, do you see your relationship with God more in line with Kohlberg's six steps of morality or what Philemon says or what Paul says to Philemon in verse 9? I appeal to you, therefore, in love. Or is it actually one of these six steps that you use or utilize or internalize of why you obey God or why you choose to live for him? So here are the six behind me. So we'll start from the bottom. We'll go upwards. Step one, basically saying, I do the right thing to avoid punishment. How many of you in your relationship with God do you do the right thing because you want to avoid punishment? Step two, I do the right thing to receive the greatest reward. Step three, I do the right thing to secure approval. Step four, I do the right thing to uphold the law and to avoid guilt. Step five, I do the right thing because it's right for me and it's right for others. That's a good reason. Step six, I do the right thing because of my conscience and moral values that are a part of who I am. But Philemon in verse 9 says it's none of these six steps that Kohler developed as the primary motivation that Christianity puts forth to Philemon and to us for being a good neighbor. It's none of those. In verse 8, he actually says, I could put forth, right, Kohlberg's step 5. It's right for you and it's right for Anismus. It's the right thing to do, the morally right thing to do. Or he could even say step 3. In order for you to do this, Philemon, the reason why you should do it is because you want to secure my approval, Paul's approval. He doesn't say that. In verse 9, he says, on the basis of love, I contend to you that you should do what I'm about to ask you to do. But earlier, we asked the question, whose love? On the basis of whose love in verse 9? If you take a look at the letter of Philemon, there's one name that appears 21 times in different variations throughout the book of Philemon. 21 times. Six times Jesus, five times Lord, Christ eight times, and God two times. And the main character of Philemon is not Paul. It's not Philemon. It's not Onesimus. It's Jesus' love. Look at Philemon chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Philemon chapter 1, verse 3. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Philemon chapter 1, verse 9, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So again, come back to me. Here's the question that you need to be asking yourself. Does your obedience to good neighboring, to loving others, following God, obeying his teaching, share more similarities with Lawrence Kohlberg's six steps of morality, where the reprimand of God, a spiritual timeout, peer pressure, fear, guilt, or even morality is driven by obedience, or do you obey on the basis of love, the love of Christ? You know, if you take a look at verse 9, this word love, it actually translates to a love feast of charity. Do you know Jesus' love feast of charity? Is that the driver for your obedience? Look at verse 9b. He says, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul 
right? He's reminding Philemon as if he doesn't know that it's him, right? Hey, it's me, Paul, an old man. I don't know what relevance that has, but, right, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, verse 10, that I appeal to you for my son, Anisimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Now, this phrase there, became my son, literally means while I gave spiritual birth. He is my son, Anisimus. Now, if you're in here and you've ever given birth before, you might take a little bit of offense to this phrase, right? But he literally does mean it in a spiritual sense. Hey, this is my guy. This is my son. His name is Anisimus. Do you know him by any chance? Formerly, verse 11, he was useless to you because you ran away, right? He literally deserted. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. And I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. And that's, again, splachnon, my internal gut heart. Right? He's like, this is my son. I gave spiritual birth to him. He's the gut of my bowels. And I'm sending him back to you. Talk about some pressure. Verse 13. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the sake of Jesus, the gospel. But I don't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Now pause there. Up till this point, Paul's request, right, he's, it seems like he's leaning towards forgiveness. This idea of, hey, forgive him. I know he ran away from you, but love on him. Take care of him. That seems to be the natural progression. But in verse 15, now go to verse 16. It comes straight out of left field. He said, while, while was that you might have him back forever, verse 16, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave. And better there means better above, beyond, more than a slave as a dear brother. And dear there actually translates to beloved, which means Onesimus is seen as God's beloved. Another translation is, is his favorite, God's favorite. Because if you're in Christ, you're all of his favorites. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man, as a brother in the Lord. Verse 17, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And welcome means accept him with pleasure. Do you see? Do you see the countercultural standard that Paul is raising Philemon to based on Jesus' love for him? Watch this. Paul is not only asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus for stealing, escaping, and not returning, but he's saying, set aside your rights as a Roman nobleman to recur your debt and even have him killed and instead choose compassion why because if jesus so loved you philemon that's the argument so much so that he went to the cross for you and died for you then you can also forgive onesimus you can choose compassion over your own rights so here's the second challenge this afternoon that i believe and we'll put it up here that god is trying to teach us through this pandemic is that Christianity actually reframes our hearts to choose compassion over my rights. What deems to be a right that we have. Uh, Now, before we get into kind of this final challenge, I do want to address maybe an elephant in the room. And it's actually the word in verse verse 16. The NIV translates it as slavery. And maybe you've heard it before, where somebody maybe says to you, John, the New Testament, the Bible in American history has been used as a weapon to legitimize slavery in the Americas. How can you actually believe in a Jesus and Christianity that would advocate for, or that seemingly advocates for slavery? Maybe you've ever asked that question before, and how do you, how do you work that out and process that out in your mind? Now, if you've noticed also throughout my message, I've actually used two different words interchangeably. I've used slavery and also bond servant 
servanthood, or that Onesimus was a bond servant. So back in Rome, back in this time, slavery is not what we, what you and I know as American chattel slavery, where it was the subjugation of a taking of a people and removing them by force to a new nation. Back then, bond servanthood, which is the better translation, bond servanthood was more like if I owed you, if I borrowed from you $50,000 and I couldn't repay it back in the given time, I would voluntarily enter into bond servanthood for at least seven years of time to be able to repay back my loan through my work. Actually, if you look historically, there were times when bond servants were released after their seven-year term and were given wages that they worked through those seven-year terms. So it's a different type of slavery or servanthood that Paul is addressing in Philemon. But even beyond that, all right, here's a reference for you that you might want to have in your back pocket. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, Exodus 21, verse 16, it says this. God says to Israel, anyone who kidnaps and sells another person must be put to death. That's the line. Anyone who kidnaps and sells another person must be put to death. The idea that God ever approved American chattel slavery is obnoxious. It's actually anti-biblical. It's simply not true. It doesn't hold actually any weight historically. If you think about it with me just for a moment before we go back into the, the main point here. Jesus said that there are the two greatest commandments— The first, he said, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. There is absolutely no way that Jesus Christ would confirm or condone or accept or advocate for American chattel slavery. There's no way he would have said that that was the Christian thing to do or was the right thing to do. But what I want you to notice here, even beyond that in the book of Philemon, is that Paul calls Philemon even to a higher standard. He doesn't just say, hey, you're right, chattel slavery and Roman bond servanthood are different, and therefore we should just simply accept bond servanthood. He doesn't say that. He actually looks at Philemon and says, you know what? Verse 16, I'm going to call you to a higher challenge. Because of the motivating love of Jesus Christ, Accept him, look at verse 16, no longer as a slave, no longer as a bondservant, but better than one as a dear brother. For he is very dear to me, and he should be even more dear to you. So verse 17, if you consider me a partner, welcome him with exceeding joy. Even after he stole from you and ran away from you, and now I'm forcing him back to you with this awkward letter. Welcome him. So again, here's a second challenge that I believe that God is trying to call our church to and to remind us about is that Christianity reframes our hearts to choose compassion, compassion over my rights. Philemon absolutely had every right to keep Onesimus as a bondservant, but Paul calls him to a higher standard. Now, this is a series that where we're, unpacking lessons and processing lessons that we're learning through the pandemic. And I just want to make this very practical for you. So I'm going to choose to wade into some touchy waters as just one practical application, right? So after the initial closure and mandated restrictions on gathering, including places of worship, two of the loudest questions that were coming from the general evangelical landscape seem to be asking these two questions. Number one, how do we protect our religious liberty which is a good question. And number two, if physical gatherings of Sunday should be considered essential on the same level of other essential work. We're all a part of that. We're asking those questions. And this is my application that I believe that we can get from Philemon here as we process the pandemic. There's tremendous value, and I want you to hear me on this, in pursuing religious liberty and challenging governmental mandates when they are in direct conflict with God, and assembling together our current Sunday format is helpful. But I want to suggest to you that the application of Paul challenging Philemon to choose compassion over his rights 
should drive us as a church and Christians to not only ask how we might protect our religious liberty and to process if physical Sunday gatherings should be considered essential, but to actually be asking how can we manage the tension of our needs with serving the most vulnerable? How can we allow compassion to lead our decisions for regathering? How can we sacrifice on the behalf of the most vulnerable? And this is not to negate COVID and its physical, emotional, and spiritual toll, but again, a lesson that I believe that God is solidifying within our community and why we as a church decided to go above and beyond state guidelines, even as we regather, is because we believe that just as Paul called out Philemon to allow the love of Christ to lead his decisions regarding Onesimus, that we will not allow our American value of liberty and my right to choose be the loudest drum that we beat, but instead we will ask the question of compassion. How do we manage our needs in the midst of living out compassionately? Now, as you can naturally deduce, choosing compassion over our rights, it has many implications, right? So here are a few beyond COVID. When it comes to redistricting lines in our community so that more lower-income families can attend our child's school, do we choose compassion or do we choose our own rights? And they're our own rights. They're American-valued rights that we have. But Philemon is challenging Paul is challenging Philemon beyond his rights. He's saying, do you choose compassion in those moments? When there's an agenda to open up the border to receive more refugees, do we err on the side of compassion, or do we, say, do we err on the side of our own rights? If our governor calls us back into lockdown, and yet our church has the right to continue to gather, but we believe that following guidelines will allow compassion to lead our decisions, be our sacrifice on the behalf of the most vulnerable, allow us to manage our tension of our needs with serving the most vulnerable, do we choose not to meet in person? Or do we choose to go remote for a period of time? There are many implications of Scripture to us in 2021 in the middle of a pandemic. And one of them, honestly, simply is, do we, as Christ followers, choose compassion over our own rights? And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a hard pill and question to ask and to swallow. Now, at this point, you might be asking, but John, when's enough compassion? When's the line of how much I need to love and sacrifice? And so here's the final lesson this afternoon, this challenge I believe God is trying to teach Christians through the pandemic. And this is the third one. We'll put it up here on the screen for you is that Christianity pushes the boundaries of charity and invites the other in as family. Look at verse 16 for me. Paul writes to Philemon, Dear literally beloved, right, which means God's favorite, but dear brother. Brother means close friend, somebody who is equal in status. Paul not just says, Paul doesn't simply say, just forgive him and let's move on. He says, look at verse 21. I know you will do more than I ask. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Meaning even better, above, beyond than I'm asking you. What was Paul's ask? It was to take Onesimus, who was a bondservant who ran away, and to bring him back and then to make him a brother. When we ask the question of how much compassion is enough compassion, I believe Philemon says to us that Christianity actually pushes us from the bandwidth of charity into family. To say, how can we love on people like they are a part of our family? Look at verse 22. Paul says, and this might make the conversation really, really awkward if Philemon says no, right? We actually don't know how he responded specifically through this text. But Paul says, and one more thing, by the way, I want you to prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answers to your prayers. 
Paul is saying, hey, look, Philemon, I'm coming to visit you. And I just sent you this letter making a case, a compelling case that you should let him go and make him a brother. And if you don't, I'm coming and I want the guest room. So that's going to be pretty awkward for you if you don't. You know, Philemon is one of the most unlikely of gospel transformation stories. It's where Paul leads Philemon. Watch this progression, all right? It's where Paul leads Philemon to Jesus. Onesimus is a bondservant who runs away from Philemon. Onesimus runs into Paul in Rome and is converted. And then Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon. But get this. The Orthodox tradition actually believes, although we don't know through Scripture, they believe that Onesimus is the same Onesimus named by Ignatius of Antioch as the primary elder and leader of the church in Ephesus after Timothy died. And he preached in various countries, Spain and Italy, throughout Rome, declaring the gospel of Jesus. You know what Philemon is? Philemon is a short story of how the gospel transformed Philemon to lay down his rights, allowing Onesimus to become one of the primary elders of one of the most prominent churches in Christian history. It's actually a flabbergasting story. If we take time to consider what all had to transpire, for Onesimus according to the Orthodox tradition, to become the elder and leader of one of the most prominent churches in the New Testament church. It's a bondservant to redemption to leader of Ephesus story. You should make a movie about that, Hollywood. So beyond being motivated by love and not law, choosing compassion over our rights, and pushing the boundaries of who we define as family, here's just one final application to consider if you're a follower of Jesus. All right, it'll be in three circles. The first is this. Uh, who is your Paul? Who is your Paul? Somebody who encourages you. All right, don't allow social distancing to drive you towards social isolation. But who's somebody that can shoulder the burden with you and walk with you as we talked about last week? The second one. But who is your Philemon? Somebody that you're encouraging and challenging. And who is the third? Who is your Onesimus? Who is somebody that you're advocating for? I really believe that one of the lessons that God is trying to teach us as a church throughout this pandemic are these three questions. Who is your Paul? Who is your Philemon? And who is your Onesimus? Father, I thank you, God, so much for just this short letter that you wrote, that you allowed Paul to write to a historical person in the city of Colossae called Philemon. God, our prayer, my prayer, honestly, is simply that each of us would have a Paul in our lives who encourages us, that each of us would have a Philemon in our lives that we're pouring into and that each of us would have an Onesimus in our lives that we're advocating for. God, may this book, this short letter, become an anthem, a part of the DNA of 168 Community Church. God, as we move forward, may we take up the call to be a good neighbor for the sake of your gospel. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you're able, I'm going to encourage you to stand as we close with this one song.
And placid are the wounded ones in mourning Brave enough to show the Lord their scars And placid are the hurts that are not hidden Open to the healing touch of God The kingdom is yours take maybe about 30 seconds just and the if you can put those three bubbles up again for me and the question that I just want you to ask yourself you know in this room and also on the stream as well uh, which one out of those three is maybe God or the Holy Spirit speaking to you about you know are you praying is God asking you to pray for a Paul to come into your life somebody who can encourage you who can challenge you 
not just encourage you, but challenge you. That was Paul's life in Philemon. Is God asking you to ask him about who your Philemon might be or who your Onesimus might be? Next 30 seconds just between you and the Lord, and then I'll close up in prayer. Just come before God and bring one of those items, one of those persons before him, and then we'll close together. Let's pray together. Father, I, I just pray, Lord, for the people in this room, God, and also those who are watching on the stream. Lord, you know exactly where each person is at. God, whether their heart's prayer in the last 30 seconds was for a Paul, for that you would send them a Paul in their lives. And one that will encourage them, love on them, but direct them towards you, God, and what is true. Somebody who will compel them to obey you and to follow you because of the love of Jesus Christ. God, or whether it's a call for them to be asking for you to send them a Philemon or for their eyes to be open to see somebody that they could pour into and love on. God, or if it's somebody that you're calling a person to advocate for, I pray, God, that you give us tender hearts, that you give us open hearts to receive it and to walk in courage with you in it. So God, we just give you thanks for this short letter, the shortest letter in the entirety of the Bible, God, and the richness that you provide for us through it. May we live unhurried. May we live for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be here. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to say goodbye to the West family, please do that uh, before they leave. We're so grateful for you and your family and your dedication to the Lord. Uh, you have 168 hours this week. Let's go live for Jesus. Have a great week.